Hello, sunshine. I'm Alexi Lawless, and welcome to the State of the Union podcast, where we look at the beautiful game on and off the field through the lens of red, white, and blue colored glasses. This week, we'll be talking Bale and Menudo and MLS and Bears and Open Cup and transfer news and U.S. Women's National Team and 26 player rosters and under 20s and so much more. But first, joining me, as always, my friend, my colleague, my guiding light, David Mossy, a soccer savant and a Fox soccer researcher and writer extraordinaire. Mossy, how are you on this Monday, June 27th in the glorious year of 2022? I am doing well. I am wondering if that studio is going to be available when we finally return. This has been quite a long time uh, without doing one of these in person. You know, we we have to bob, we have to weave. We are in the summer months and there's things going on. And uh, I am actually going right from this taping, recording, uh, if you will, to LAX. And I'm off to the East Coast. Uh, I'll be taking a little uh, trip with the family. And uh, my daughter is of the age where she's starting to think about uh, going to college. Um, knock on wood that she actually gets in uh, someplace. And so we're trying to <laughs> narrow it down to kind of, you know, maybe a hemisphere at this point, because uh, it's wide open out there. I think she's established that she wants to leave California, which I interpret as get as far away from her parents as possible. So that's that's the only thing that we've established so far. So we're going to have a little fun little East Coast trip swing where I'll, we'll be seeing a bunch of schools. A couple of things on that. If she wants to go to the University of Michigan, let me know. I'll make a couple of phone calls. She's in. I'm sure you have a direct line to the uh, the Wolverines yes. over there. Uh, <laughs> number two, on my flight back from New York, uh, when I was returning from working that FIFA host city announcement show uh, on the on the plane, I watched uh, a few episodes of The Sopranos, including an episode from the first season titled The College, in which Tony takes Meadow to see a bunch of schools. Um, that is cited as often cited as one of the handful of greatest Sopranos episodes ever. The first truly great one that, that indicated to people that this could be a special show. I know you're not on that page, right? But uh, nevertheless, uh, when you, when you mentioned, you know, taking your daughter yep. to see colleges, it made me think of that. Well, I'll see if I can live up to the, uh, the, the Sopranos uh, level and episode <laughs> when it comes to, to taking her, uh, taking her around. Like I said, it, it's, is it's, is completely, um, uh, preliminary, and she has no real clue about anything when it comes to the colleges out there. So this is an, an attempt. I hope it works to at least start to uh, narrow it down. And she's, and then we'll and we'll see if that happens. Either way, it's going to be a fun uh, a fun trip. Have you watched anything, Mossy, over the last week? Uh, I'm by the way back here. Uh, although we are doing this remotely, as you can see, and here I am still back in the United States, having returned successfully and safely from uh, my stint over there at FIFA with uh, the uh, the next. 90 class that I was involved in. And it was a wonderful time over there in, uh, in, in Switzerland, there in uh, Zurich at FIFA. But I'm, I'm glad to be back here on home soil and getting ready for a, a good week, including, uh, you know, the July 4th celebrations next week. Uh, a few things. I'm embarrassed to say I did actually go see uh, Jurassic World in the theater. Um, what's happened to that franchise is tragic because I still stand by the first movie. I think it was terrific. Um, and it, they've gotten progressively worse and progressively more cheesy and commercial. And this one is just two and a half hours of chases and, and trying to evade dinosaurs. There's no story whatsoever to it. Uh, so it was kind of a waste of time. But nevertheless, uh, killed off a Hold couple on hours. A Hold on a second. Listen, I, I, under, I understand. I, I have, I've not seen it, but I understand what you're saying. And it's, it's nothing new when it comes to a lot of these you know, mega films that, that spawn sequels is that it deteriorates as you go on. Not always, not always, but I mean, the first one was still the awe and the shock of seeing this and the technology that was used. But as far as the story, you feel that the story was much more evolved and deep and thorough in the first one relative to these other ones? I do. Okay. I mean, I don't want to make it seem like the first Jurassic Park is, you know, uh, <laughs> The Godfather, but right. okay. I think there was more substance there. Okay. All right. uh, but pivoting to more intellectual stuff, um, I've been doing a lot of reading lately. I just finished a book uh, on the rise to power of MBS, Mohammed bin Salman. Mm -hmm. uh, learned a lot about one of the more controversial characters in the world today. Also, 
our good friend uh, Jason Wormser recommended to me this CNN documentary about Watergate, uh, which I watch. It's a four part documentary. And there's another one on LBJ that he recommended as well. So I'm probably going to watch that this week. So that's what I've been up to. Nice. Nice. Um, I might, uh, I might check that one out then. That's, uh, that's cool. All right. What did I have here? Um, so uh, again, I was on the airplane for many, many hours going back and forth. So it was an opportunity to watch a couple of different things and, and some things that I might've missed in the past, uh, uh new things though. Um, and I watched this, uh, whatever last couple of days on HBO, there is a documentary about the group Menudo. Do you know who, who Menudo is? Mossy? No. Okay. So Menudo uh, came out in the late seventies, early eighties, a group out of Puerto Rico and the whole gimmick, I guess it was a, you know, a kid's group, uh, uh, you know, uh, boys singing group, a la Backstreet Boys and sync. But before that, uh, and the whole gimmick was obviously it was coming out of Puerto Rico. Uh, they were singing in Spanish and they, they really appealed to, um, you know, a Latin audience initially, and then they tried to break uh, global and, and sing in English. But the whole thing with them was that while it was five young boys, as soon as they turned 16, you churned them and burned them. And one would leave, uh, the 16 year old would leave and they would replace it. So it was a revolving cast of, of singers. Uh, it's a, it's a fascinating story. Um, it's not, it's, it's a dark story to be quite honest with you, but from a music perspective, it's really interesting to see how this was created and how it was sustained and at times how it went off the rails. Um, and then from a, you know, a, a more personal perspective to see how these kids, and they were just kids, some of them you know, 12 years old, being thrown into this machine, uh, especially when they came later after it had gotten very, very popular, and to see how they were treated, uh, to see how they reacted. And, and by the way, this also spawned you know, someone like Ricky Martin, who was part of uh, Menudo early on and went on to, uh, to big things. And it follows a lot of these, well, now they're, you know, uh, they're adults uh, and men, and they talk about their experiences, the good and the bad experiences. So I recommend that. That's, uh, that was really interesting. It's called Forever Young. Um, more, uh, more contemporary, The Card Counter, uh, starring uh, Oscar Isaac and uh, Ty Sheridan, two, two actors who you might not know their names, but you see them and you recognize that they are in a lot of things. Some of them are in you know, the, uh, the superhero movies and uh, really, really good actors. Uh, one's, one's in his 40s uh, and one's in his 20s, but you, you, you look at them and you say, oh, I know that guy. Uh, the Card Counter, I thought that was really, really good. Not great and very dark again, but but um, subdued. And then two things I watched on the on the airplane. One, uh, Lucy Scar starring Scarlett Johansson, which is a, a just a complete mess of a movie. I don't necessarily <laughs> recommend it. Um, and then the other one was one that I do recommend. It's a documentary called Bears. And it follows these bears around from waking up uh, this mother bear waking up with their cubs at, uh, after hibernation and going on this trek and foraging for food and protecting the bears and, and as the bears grow up and do all that. The only problem I have with it is, and this, this is such a huge portion of a documentary that is narrated by someone. John C. Riley, the, uh, the actor and the comedian, is great in a lot of different things. His voice is used in this bears documentary. And I thought that it really did a disservice to the documentary um, and I just think it was miscast, if you will. So that's my uh, take on that. But still, the footage that they have and the story that is told about these bears as they go on this <laughs> adventure with their, uh, with their mother is really interesting and fascinating and, uh, from a nature perspective and a documentary perspective. Um, anything else, Mossy? Can I just circle back for a second to my uh, Jurassic Park movie theater experience? Sure. Sure. I am hanging in there with movie theaters. I know these movies are now readily available in streaming services, but I still like the experience of going to a theater, buying popcorn, sitting there and watching the movie. But uh, the amount of previews is going to drive me away from theaters. I've ranted about this on the pod before. It is ridiculous. For Jurassic Park, I had to sit through like seven previews, half hours worth. And, you know, it just completely changes your calculation of how much time you're devoting to go see movies now. And, and you're like exhausted by the time the actual movie that you paid to see starts. Uh, oh, look at Louise chiming in. It's 20 to 20, 
five minutes at AMC. I don't oh know how God, long you guys are that. such grumpy wow. old men. I mean, this is this is such evergreen type of content here. You're like a comedian talking about uh, peanuts on the airplane or something like that. It's, it's, <laughs> I mean. Uh, All right. I get it. There's a lot of previews, but they have you captive and they're trying to tell you what's coming next. Uh, I I will say I was talking to Louise off air before we came on and he went to see Top Gun. He was not happy um, in terms of the crowd. And I get that because if you're going back to a movie theater, while a movie like Top Gun and I have yet to see it, I, I think the communal experience is part of what makes it fun. Uh, if if it's just too packed and you don't even get a good seat, then I think it's it probably takes something uh, takes something away. D- did you know, Mossy, though, that Luis, while he has seen Maverick, Top Gun, he has never seen the original. <laughs> so it's like he's reading the book from back to uh, from uh, from back to front, uh, and the context, which I think is so important when it comes to it. But he said he enjoyed it, so that yeah. probably is a sign of a good movie. In this case, I, I actually think Top Gun Maverick can stand alone. He, he probably would have liked it even more had he seen the original and understood some of the references. But I do think it's a very good movie that could stand on its own. Well, I have seen the original. I have yet to see Maverick. But I think in this little uh, mini break that I have here coming up, uh, me and my wife, because I think my kids have seen it, um, are going to go and check out Maverick. And look, everybody has said it's great. And everybody can't be wrong. Can they, Mossy? No, no, it's. It's it's great. So I'm excited to go uh, go see that. Maybe I'll go see it on on July 4th. Hell, can that can you get any more American than that? That would be awesome. Uh, all right, Moss, you ready to light this candle? Let's do it. All right. Uh, let's start it off. Where do you want to start here, my friend? Uh, should we start with, I mean, the big news when it comes to um, Major League Soccer and, you know, this this ongoing quest to be to be relevant and to be credible? Well, news comes down uh, over the last week that. Uh, Gareth Bale, uh, I guess now former Real Madrid player, captain of Wales, uh, one of the great players, I, I would argue, on the planet, although he has not played a whole lot, will be taking his talents right here to the City of Angels and playing with LAFC uh, starting later on this summer. And uh, it's a free transfer. He is not a designated player. And we'll get into a little bit more of the uh, the business behind it. But first off, Mossy, general thoughts on the announcement from LAFC and Major League Soccer, for that matter, that Gareth Bale will be coming to uh, our shores. Very exciting news. I think the upside here is off the charts. Uh, he's not as famous as David Beckham. He's not as charismatic as Latan. He's not Mexican like Chicharito. But from a strictly soccer perspective, when you factor in The talent, the cost, as you mentioned, the fact that it's not a a DP deal and the situation he's walking into. He's not being asked to carry a team. He's joining what is arguably already the best team in the league. I think this has the potential to be an incredible signing. Uh, I am going to play devil's advocate and bring up a couple of things to you in a minute. But but overall, I give this very high marks. Yeah, I think that this is a feather in the cap of LAFC and Major League Soccer that you have. Um, the captain of a World Cup-bound team in the the four months prior to playing in the World Cup, uh, a player of global renown, a player who had plenty of different opportunities afforded to him, that he specifically picked Major League Soccer and LAFC. I think that that says a lot because he is coming here and he is – you know, I guess from all intents and purposes, preparing for the World Cup in November and December, preparing for what could arguably be the greatest moment of his playing career, representing Wales at the World Cup. And that's not to be taken taken lightly, especially for a player that hasn't played a lot over the last couple of years. And so I think that there is a, a strategy to it, both short term in terms of the World Cup and long term post World Cup. But I don't think that you can, you know, under undersell um, the the importance of this decision and the credibility behind it relative to the appearance at the World Cup uh, coming forward. So and and to your point, the rich get richer when it comes to LAFC because he's not a designated player. And by the way, LAFC still has a designated player uh, spot open. And John Thorrington, uh, the head over there that is making these decisions has already stated publicly that they think they're going to fill that designated spot. He's coming into a first place team. He's coming into a team that is flying uh, and 
you know, burning uh, through the uh, through the opposition. These are champagne problems for head coach Steve Terundolo as to where these players are going to play. But, you know, from a um, from a marketing perspective and from a competitive perspective, this checks boxes. And so I'm here for it. I'm excited about it. I'll, uh, I'll tell you a little bit how, how I feel relative to the other teams and certainly to the uh, the neighbors down south when it comes to the LA, uh, LA Galaxy. From an on-the-field perspective, Mossy, are you concerned that this is a player that, while he has functioned and functioned at a high level from the international perspective for Wales, it's this weird situation. He not only hasn't functioned from a club perspective, but literally just hasn't played a lot. Yeah, so I said I would play devil's advocate, so here we go. Um, we can debate how we got here with regards to the Gareth Bale Real Madrid situation. My sense is that most people outside of Madrid are pro Bale and feel like he was mistreated there. I'm generally on that page, while folks in Madrid might feel differently about it. But however we got here, the last couple of years have been weird, and it's fair to wonder where Gareth Bale's head is at with regards to club football. I know most people are framing the World Cup being around the corner as a positive. It means he's going to be motivated because he wants to be in good form heading into that tournament. But others have said that Bale was seeking out a situation where he wasn't going to have to exert himself that much the next few months because he wants to be fresh for the World Cup, which to me would not be the ideal mentality for a player joining your club. Uh, is there any concern about that? Um, that you're, he's just kind of mothballing himself there. I don't think so. I mean, yeah, I guess there would be concern and that would, I mean, that I would be not only sad, but I would be angry if that ultimately uh, happened. I mean, you know, there's, look, we can joke about it, you know, almost being a Trojan horse because guess what? The U S faces Wales in that first game. And I actually think that that first game against Wales is crucial to the fate of this uh, men's national team come November and December in Qatar. I think, I think you got to win that game. And, um, and I think it's, it is winnable even with, with Bale, but he is a huge, huge and important part of that team. And I think even he recognizes that he has to be playing. I mean, we could, we could say this about any player. You just, you mothball them, you put them in bubble wrap and not anything can happen, but these are players still. And I do think that, there's a, I think there is a correlation and a reason why he has done well with his national team. I think that there is a connection that he makes. And I think that there is a, a responsibility. And you, you might not agree or you might think that it's ridiculous for someone to have that connection um, as opposed to the club team that's paying him all of these millions and millions of dollars. But your, your nation um, and that connection with your nation and your, your people, I think that does foster a responsibility. And I think that we see that playing out. And so I think that his preparation in body and mind for the World Cup, I think will be relative to that responsibility that he feels to his nation. Uh, my second question would be tactical. Bale's uh, preferred position would be on the right, cutting into that left foot. Uh, that's where Carlos Vela plays. So uh, one of them has to move and play somewhere else. Keep in mind, Bale can play as a center forward. He didn't play that much for Real Madrid this past season, but a couple of times that he did, it was as a center forward and he looked pretty good. I remember one game against Villarreal in particular in which he played very well up there. And at one point this season, Real Madrid were talking themselves into him potentially being the backup to Benzema as a center forward and filling a role that Jovic and Mariano were unable to fill. Um, so I saw Tom Bogart, who had a big couple of days, by the way, he broke the bail story and he filled in for Matt Doyle in the armchair analyst uh, column. Um, he put together a LAFC projected lineup. He had Vela on the right, Bale's a center forward, Brian Rodriguez, uh, on the left. Um, others have suggested Bale on the left, Vela on the right, Arango down the middle, but whatever the case, there is something to be sorted out there. And uh, if this was a league where it was just 38 games, whoever, accumulates the most points at the end wins, then I wouldn't be that concerned. They'll rotate, they'll mix and match. And it's just about churning out the points, but we know uh, the way MLS is structured, they, there is going to come a day where they're going to play a do or die playoff game. And it is pertinent to ask, you know, it, what would be the ideal lineup? Uh, you know, the, so it, it is something for a true to figure out. I know it's champagne problems, but never, nevertheless, it is something he has to sort it out. It is. And he, he will have thought about this. Um, and look, it, it doesn't even mean that Steve Terundolo, and I haven't talked to him about this, but he, this might not have been 
his desire to have this as, as, as strange as that may sound. I mean, this, this was a, a ship that was cruising and continues to cruise in the right direction. Um, keep in mind, this is also coming at a time when Chiellini is, is part of the, uh, the equation and where is he going to fit? And there are no coaches that are crying for Steve Terundolo for these difficult decisions that he is ultimately going to, uh, to have to make. So how does this all come about? Because as we said, Bale had plenty of options around. Well, you know, I know the jokes are out there about golf and, uh, but, but keep in mind that the advantage and the competitive advantages that teams have over others out there are real. And when you talk about Los Angeles, I don't think I'm <laughs> crazy for saying that a lot of players from the outside that are looking at potentially coming to Major League Soccer would want to come to a place like Los Angeles, especially when they have options out there. And it does put other cities and teams at a disadvantage. But Steve Toronto, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, John Thorrington came out yesterday when asked about the structure of this deal. And we don't know ultimately how it's going to look from, while he's not a designated player now, and from a financial perspective, it looks good now. We don't know what could happen in the future and could there be more money that kicks in. But but still, he was very, very clear that this was not relative to going to place that is going to pay him the most money. But it is going to Los Angeles, where the quality of life, the opportunities, the different things that you have at your disposal out here, including golf, by the way, are, are abundant. As it relates to Los Angeles, you know, we live here and we have seen the soccer wars with the Z go on and the, uh, the old guard and the OGs of Los Angeles galaxy, where this nouveau riche of LAFC have come in. You know, again, I find myself scratching my head and my, the part of me that is the you know, that galaxy, given my history, both on and off the field with that, with that club, I find myself being sad and irritated because the galaxy from the moment that they started back in 1996 have positioned themselves as a super club, as big, bold, arrogant in the things that they do. And LAFC came into the market and did some big, bold things. But right now, at this moment, as we sit here recording on Monday, January 27th, 2022, there is only one super club in Los Angeles. And the Galaxy pale in comparison. And I know they can rest on the, the Traffico results. And by the way, there's another Traffico coming up. And who knows who will be involved in that one? Look forward to that. But ultimately, it is LAFC that is going out and doing big things. It is LAFC that's going out there and making a splash. And it's LAFC, by the way, on the field in totality that is having success. And it's LAFC that we are talking about. And we'll talk about other teams. Don't worry. This is not just an LA centric type of thing, despite accusations to the contrary out there from, uh, from folks. But this is the big news when it comes to Major League Soccer right now. And I'm here for it. I'm excited, but I am to a certain extent disappointed that. I want, I want the Galaxy to compete. I want them to fight. I don't want them to hand over the mantle so easily to LAFC, which is what it seems they have been doing over the last few years. It is, it is interesting, the evolution of LAFC's transfer strategy. It, they started out signing a lot of younger South American players, the Palacios and Atuestas and uh, Diego Rossi, Brian Rodriguez, Cifuentes. And they were differentiating themselves from the Galaxy in that way. The Galaxy, people thought, were still stuck in the old school MLS approach of signing these veteran world-class players. Uh, then this past offseason, LAFC really pivoted to signing MLS veterans, the Acostas and Hollingshead, Ilya Sanchez. And now that they've built this foundation, now they're going to start plopping a couple of big you know, European veteran names in Bale and Chiellini. So... You know, do you think they, they've played it perfectly where they, they it's not like the Galaxy where it, sometimes it feels like the Galaxy sign these veteran players and expect them to carry the team. Well, LAFC built this really solid foundation and have a lot of younger, exciting players. And now they're plopping these veterans on top of it. Yeah, it's it's balance. And keep in mind, you know, two of these big names still have not been integrated into the group. And you, you it could be a mess. It, you know, Kalini could get out there and get blown by by any number of fast players out there, despite how good the LAFC team is. I don't necessarily think that's going to happen. There will be moments where we're going to turn around and go, 
wow, uh, that's a different looking Kalini than we've seen. Um, and we don't know, to your point, where Bale is going to uh, is going to fit in. But I think that they've gotten it right. I think they have the proper balance. I think they have smart people behind the scenes. Uh, the Chirundolo hire, while young and inexperienced, so far, so good. And there will be turbulent times ahead. But right now, it's, it's going great. Um, we talked a little bit off air yesterday. Uh, and I, we didn't ultimately get into this discussion on air about all of that talent, because keep in mind, not for nothing, but you got Carlos Vela, who finally is healthy, finally is playing. According to Taylor Twelman, the deal has finally been signed, despite it coming down to the wire here. And by the time you're listening to this, it may have been announced. I don't uh, I don't know, but we're going to go with Carlos Vela is also going to be a part of this project. And my good friend Stu Holden last night on air was talking about how he really feels that this team is built for the present. And I do, I, I agree, but the present also is, you know, potentially winning a supporter shield, potentially winning an MLS cup, qualifying for champions league. We saw what Seattle has done, having that global um, significance and credibility and relevance, I, I think is important to someone like uh, LAFC. And so this project might include the next two years where you're throwing everything in the kitchen sink uh, to win right now. But when it comes to the actual players on the field, I will argue, Mossy, okay, that Gareth Bale, while a wonderful player, is not even necessarily the best player on this LAFC team when all are healthy and all are there. I think that Carlos Vela right now is a better player. And so if you're putting in a position, I would rather uh, defer to Carlos Vela into what his best position is because I think ultimately that is going to be more impactful uh, than where Bale is going to play. No, you're right. When we were talking off the air, I raised this issue of uh, Bale and Vela playing the same position. And you right away said Bale is the one that has to accommodate Carlos Vela. This is Carlos Vela's team. You still consider him the best player on this team, which was kind of a bombshell. I was hoping you guys would have that conversation on the air, but we had so many other aspects of this transfer to discuss that we didn't really get around to that. So uh, now you said it here and hopefully Luis is clipping this off as a Twitter. Uh, <laughs> Carlos Vela is better than Gareth Bale. And we can have some fun with that this well, week. Do you, do you agree or disagree? Uh, I, well, in general, I think Gareth Bale is the better player, but there is something to the fact that Carlos Vela is already accustomed to playing for this club and this league. So uh, it wouldn't surprise me if at least in the short term, he's, the more productive of the two uh, bail. There's going to be a, an adaptation period. Uh, the interesting thing, as far as that goes for me, is that they've been working on the Vela extension for months while this bail opportunity just arose. I wonder if the timing had been different, whether they might've considered signing Gareth Bell as the replacement for Carlos Vela uh, instead of having them both on the same team. Uh, but it doesn't sound like that was even an option because the, the Vela deal was essentially done by the time the bail opportunity arose. I mean, look, this is, this is ultimately, this is all good things. Um, I think that this is going to be fun. You know, the the evergreen type of accusation of it being a retirement league, I don't think that it applies to this to uh, to this signing. The cleaning one might be a little different, but we'll see how uh, this, this ultimately goes. This is not an LAFC show, so we're going to move on, but it was big news. And I think it did transcend um, from just one team or uh, or one market, because this is big news within uh, with it, within the league. And again, the advantage that LA has uh, location, 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 and and money, sure. But that was, I don't think, as Thorington made it very clear, the priority when it comes to uh, when it comes to signing someone like Bale. And look, there were other teams that I'm sure with the with the structure of this, him being a TAM player, not a designated player, that would have jumped at the opportunity to do it. But I think he had his eyes set on uh, some different places and limited type of places that he wanted to go. So we'll see how it goes for him from an MLS perspective. We'll see how much he plays. And then we'll obviously see how it impacts him and his form when he gets to the World Cup in November, December, where we, as the U.S., will be facing his Wales team uh, in that first game of the World Cup and a really, really important uh, game. Should we hit some other games here, Mossy? I will say that you said this isn't an LAFC show, but the first game uh, in our little uh, weekend review is the LAFC New York well, they, Red Bulls. Well, they won, match. but I think, I mean, again, it goes back to star stars, right? I mean, it goes back to stars. Who's in the stands? Boom. 
Mbappe. All right. It was fresh off of an appearance. I think he went to the NBA draft or something like that. Cause he's a huge NBA yep. uh, guy. And so he was right there at the bank over there uh, watching the LAFC take care of Red Bulls uh, two to nothing. So they just can keep trucking on and who knows, maybe a future LAFC player many, many years down the line. Well, and, and this result just underscores what we said, that Bale is joining what is already a very good team. LAFC beat the Red Bulls 2-0. Uh, Arango and Palacios with the goals. Um, Luquinez and Aaron Long didn't play, so I don't read too much into this from the Red Bulls' perspective, uh, but a nice win for LAFC, who are atop the Supporter Shield race. Uh, so they keep rolling in anticipation of adding some big-name talent. Uh, we did the Philadelphia NYCFC <laughs> game. Um, and, Where to begin? Uh, What's that? I said where to begin on this one. I know. Okay. So uh, Philadelphia NYCFC, a battle for first place, basically out there in the, uh, in the Eastern Conference. Two very, very good teams, but also two very, very different teams. Obviously, we know NYCFC defending MLS Cup champions, um, you know, part of the, <laughs> the city group structure and the, that whole uh, monster that, that is. A very, very good team with lots of talented players and plenty of money, as opposed to the Philadelphia Union that is, while it's not a small market, it behaves as a small market team. And that's not that's not necessarily a bad thing. This is the the, the path that they have chosen, so much so that when, when we talked to uh, Jim Curtin, it was really interesting to talk to Jim Curtin and see how he has wrapped his mind around and not only accepted it, but almost embraced the fact that this is who they are. And it enables them at times to play that underdog card and punch up other weight and do all that kind of stuff. But I mean, this is a Jim Curtin who's been there for nine years now. I can't believe he's been there for nine, nine years. And he recognizes that he has to do more with less relative to other, uh, relative to other teams out there. It was interesting, Mossy though. I didn't get to say this, uh, this on, this on air, but I did talk to um, Alejandro Bedoya, the captain of the Philadelphia Union. And I asked him because he's a smart guy and I, and I think he's been around and he has some perspective about things he would like to see change in the league. And the first thing he went to without hesitation was he wants teams that want to spend more to be given the freedom to spend more. And look, I know that this kind of runs counter to the structure of the league, but it was interesting that he, uh, the captain of a team, that spends much less than others and looks to punch above their weight and looks to youth development and is very successful in that. He recognizes that for the overall good and for the collective, that some of those constraints and restraints have to be taken off in order for the league to move forward. And I, I came back at him and said, well, what happens when your owner brings you in and says, hey, you know, you're, you're putting me in a bind here because you are putting pressure on me to keep up with the Joneses, even though I don't necessarily think that that is the proper structure and business uh, model to have, you know, the public pressure of, hey, look what NYCFC is doing, look what others are doing right there. And I think he was really philosophical in, in the way that he responded, saying, yes, but this is a rising tide, I'm paraphrasing here, basically a rising tide uh, for all boats here, and that it actually, others being able to spend more, while it might put more pressure on those uh, owners that don't want to spend as much, it is good in totality. And again, this is a single entity. And so it was just interesting to pick his brain uh, a little bit. Ultimately, Philadelphia ended up getting the 2-1 win at the death at, from the uh, on-the-field perspective. Where do you want to start? Because there's all sorts of crazy stuff that went on. Uh, well, we should start with the brawl and okay. the trainer getting sent off. Uh, your impressions of that whole situation? Um, it was, uh, you know, the, the best trainer-athlete uh, relationship defense that I have seen since uh, Mickey in terms of a Philadelphia trainer coming to the aid uh, of their <laughs> uh, of their athlete. And I, I said so much on Twitter, although with a, uh, a correction because of, uh, you know, my lack of spelling or my lack of editing when it comes to that. But I thought it was incredible. For those that didn't see it, the Philadelphia trainer came on the field to attend to a injured, and I use that loosely, player, you know, at that point, uh, you never know what's going on. And, you know, there was some back and forth and this has happened before. And I, I'll be the first to admit that at times, sometimes when you see a player go down, you'll say, get up and you're okay. And all that kind of stuff. And there was some back and forth and some, some physical, uh, you know, touching and pushing and <laughs> that kind of stuff. And the trainer who was there to obviously look out for the injured player and to do his or her job 
took offense to the fact that NYCFC players were, you know, milling around and pointing and jawing and doing all that. <laughs> now it's one thing to just say, Hey, get away. But I mean, he had evidently wanted to fight this, this guy is incredible, by the way, uh, you know, full on sleeve tats up and down with his, uh, with his surgical gloves on. And he had to be restrained <laughs> from going after the NYCFC players. And ultimately uh, he was given a red card and went off to high fives and all that kind of stuff. Now, listen, I don't want trainers out there <laughs> getting into it with other with, with other players, but there's a part of me that loves the uh, the the Philly esque type of reaction. I mean, this is a guy that you want on your side. By the way, this is a guy that is going to get bought plenty of beers, and this is a guy who you want in a bar in a in a uh, in a bar fight because he is going to do anything and everything to protect you. And I think ultimately that's where it came from. It came from a good place. He was trying to protect this person that, you know, was his player and he, who he was trying to treat. Thoughts on the, uh, the melee out there? I like that there seems to be some genuine animosity between these two teams. You know, some of the rivalries in MLS can feel manufactured, but this one isn't. These two teams played in the Eastern Conference final last year. Philadelphia had a COVID outbreak leading up to that game. They tried to get it postponed. MLS said no. They had to play it anyway. They lost. They felt cheated by all that. Uh, NYCFC went on to win MLS Cup, so I'm sure there's some resentment from the Philadelphia side, and they were able to get some measure of revenge uh, by winning this game, which, as you mentioned, leapfrogged them in, above NYCFC and into first place in the East. Um, yeah, the, the top of the East there, I, I think Philadelphia, NYCFC, and the Red Bulls, are all very strong teams. Uh, I think any combination of those three, if they play in the Eastern Conference final, would be quite tasty. Um, I will say on NYCFC, they were absolutely rolling. And then Ronnie Dyla leaves to go to Standard Liège. I know it's a small sample. They appointed Nick Cushing, an assistant under Dyla, as the interim head coach. I know it's a small sample. It's just three games, including the U.S. Open Cup match against the Red Bulls. But three lousy performances, two defeats, and one draw. So they, they got to get themselves sorted there. I mean, they're so talented, but the, their heads just don't seem right. They got to accept the fact that Ronnie Dyla is not there anymore and Nick Cushing is the manager and start playing for him because uh, they were very poor for a lot of this game. And Tate Castellanos, you know, still is a great player. And who knows if he is going to be around? I mean, the question right now is what ultimately is his value? I mean, this is a goal scorer who scores in multiple ways, who I think would be very attractive to many teams in many leagues around the world, who is young, um, who is available. And, you know, even if you're talking about a $15 million price, which is one of the numbers that's getting thrown around there. I mean, that's, that's reasonable for someone who puts the ball in the net and does the most difficult thing. So they might not even have him ultimately when all is said and done at the, uh, at the end of this year, let's, let's get some other games in here. Cause I know we've kind of gone uh, along with the, with, with the bail thing here uh, when it comes to, uh, you know, RSL Columbus zero zero, but I think the big news there is the signing of Cucho Hernandez from, uh, from Watford seventh, most expensive signing in MLS history. And, you know, by the way, Columbus, Columbus needs something right now. They are well, well below the, the uh, playoff line right now, and they need an injection of something right now. You, how, how do you think this is going to work out? No, it's an exciting signing. They, they get rid of Jossi Zardes, um, and, and now they bring in uh, Hernandez. And, and yeah, I think if they create the chances for him, he'll be productive there. So I think it's yet another exciting signing for the league. A couple more standout uh, type of uh, results. You know, Cincinnati, we don't talk about Cincinnati a whole lot unless we're talking about their futility and their failure, which has been abundant over the last few years. But Cincinnati is above the playoff line right now. They've already surpassed their win total from all of last year, and we're not even to July. So, uh, you know, congratulations uh, over there to the Cincinnati folks for what they are doing. But again, it's been so bad for so many years, make the playoffs and then we'll do a whole segment on Cincinnati. How about that? And that's uh, Brenner finally getting his first goal of the season. He scored the winner and they're one. No, where's he from again? That Brenner guy. Uh, I'm ashamed to admit this these days, but he's Brazilian. Um, <laughs> he's Brazilian. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Seattle uh, took care of SKC three nil. Um, not to make this whole show about Gareth Bale, but to me, they're the team that, it, this whole bail signing and the discourse around it is going to light a fire under Seattle because at least gauging uh, by some of my conversations with Keith Costigan, uh, they're a little put off by this whole, well, just hand LAFC MLS cup. Now they're clearly the best team. Um, and, you know, keep in mind, Seattle, no Joan Paulo this season, which is a big miss, but yep. still a very talented squad. Rui Diaz, Morris, Lodero, Rodan, 
uh, Rusnak, et cetera. And so they're now above the playoff line. I imagine they're going to shoot, shoot up there and, and maybe not catch LAFC, but certainly finish as one of the higher seeds in the West. And I mentioned that in the East, I'm looking forward to some combination of NYCFC, the Red Bulls and Philadelphia meeting in the conference final uh, in the West. I, to me, LAFC Seattle would be an absolutely delicious Western conference final. We saw it um, back in 19 and, and yeah, I'd love to see that again. Uh, all right. What do you all think? Right. Pipe down Keith cost again and all you <laughs> Seattle folks out there. And we know you're insufferable. Um, you're going to be just, you're going to be just fine. And, and by the way, if history is any indication, you do not want to be the best in the regular season to be quite honest with you. So don't worry. And, and LAFC for, for all of the talent that they have and how good they actually, they actually are. I'll put money that they don't win MLS Cup because that's just how MLS functions. And there's very, very different. The regular season is very, very different to the uh, the postseason. Uh, a couple more uh, results that I think are, are worth noting. Nashville went into D.C. D.C. is in shambles uh, right now. The only good thing that's happened in D.C. over the last couple of weeks, let's be honest, they're losing games on the field. Uh, they lost out to be a, uh, a host for the 2026 World Cup, although they were awarded the MLS uh, All-Star Game. So congratulations on getting the All-Star Game. But on the field right now, D.C. not not doing well. Um, Miami uh, coming back two to one uh, against the loons in Miami. And, you know, the, the men in pink down there, I thought it was going to be another one of these Miami losses, but evidently this is the new Miami, the new inter Miami, the new David Beckham's inter Miami coming back with a big win uh, over there. And then uh, let's see what else, uh, anything else st- stood out to you, Mossy, when it comes to, uh, to results here that you want to hit on? Uh, Toronto beat Atlanta 2-1. Yep. Atlanta might just be cursed this year because Brooks Lennon goes down in warmups, suffers a knee injury, still waiting to see the severity of that. Uh, my boy Luis Araujo gets a goal, but not enough. They lose 2-1. Uh, so yeah, just a, what a <laughs> frustrating season for them. The battle of uh, Texas, which does not include uh, Houston at this point, it's basically between Austin and Dallas. Uh, another, another stalemate when it comes to two to two in Austin. Austin had to come back, being down two nothing to Dallas, uh, and they did, uh, and they made it a game, and it was an exciting. And Drew C, who uh, I, I think is on a lot of people's, including my. Uh, All star list uh, when it comes to voting out there, got another goal and continues to play well. And we have Dallas on Wednesday, by the way, exciting midweek game, LAFC Dallas on FS1. Tune into that. But I mentioned Toronto Atlanta. I kind of buried the lead there. Uh, Lorenzo Insigne was in attendance for this game. Uh, so we're a couple of weeks away from his debut. Houston beat Chicago 2 0. We're a couple of weeks away from Hector Herrera's debut for Houston. So it's not just Bale and Chiellini. There's some really big name, new faces arriving here uh, that are going to bring a different element to this MLS campaign. It's going to be fun. It's going to be fun to see all of these players and see how they integrate in with their teams. And do they push them in one direction or do they push them in the, uh, the other direction? Um, all right. You want to move on to uh, open cup really quick here before we uh, call it a day here on this first segment. Uh, yes, because uh, we did have a bit of a stunner in the quarterfinals uh, Sacramento Republic FC beat the galaxy two one. So they become the first non-MLS club to reach the semi since FC Cincinnati in 2017. They're trying to become the first non-MLS club to win the U.S. Open Cup since the Rochester Rhinos in 1999. They will face Sporting KC in the semis. Um, the, the Red Bulls, this was the other quarterfinal that caught my attention. They spanked NYCFC 3-0. They're now awaiting the winner between Orlando and Nashville, who play on Wednesday. So... Um, very interesting. Uh, Sacramento Re- Republic FC. Keep in mind that that's a city that thought they were going to get an MLS yep. team. And then uh, MLS, I guess, raised the expansion fee and it became a bit too rich for their blood. And so uh, the deal didn't materialize, but they're still hoping the next couple of years to uh, be granted an MLS franchise. And and I don't know, does this success in the U.S. Open Cup at all play into that or it doesn't really matter? I mean, don't kill the messenger, but it was always about this is a not a a like to have, but not a need to have when it comes to that market. And they're, you know, it's wonderful in terms of the soccer history. So could I see them there in the future? Sure. In the same way that I could see a lot of USL teams being part of major league soccer. But I think there also is a recognition that USL continues to grow and they are building something. And while MLS can be a, you know, a, a, a potential future endeavor, be the best you can possibly be right now. And when you get those opportunities to punch MLS in the face, take it. And again, this is not just MLS, but this is again, the LA Galaxy failing to live up to that super club 
uh, status and losing at home to Sacramento. Congratulations to Sacramento and shame on you, Los Angeles, uh, Los Angeles, uh, Angeles Galaxy. Although this is good for the Open Cup and you kind of want these things. And we talked so much in the opening rounds about these Cinderella stories and these it almost it was almost framed as good versus evil uh, with the uh, MLS clubs and the USL uh, clubs. I will say that when it comes to Sporting KC, which is having a dismal year, I think they're putting all of their eggs into this Open Cup basket. And so we have seen it before, you know, DC United and, and different teams out there that have had poor regular seasons when it comes to their MLS uh, and then figured it out from an Open Cup uh, an Open Cup perspective. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, so the semifinals... Let's see here. Uh, so who do we have? We have Sacramento is going to host Sporting KC. All right, that'll be interesting. Ooh, interesting. And then and then the Red Bulls are awaiting the winner of Orlando Nashville, which is the last quarterfinal, which hasn't been played yet. So got it, got it. All right, so some interesting stuff happening in the uh, Open Cup. Anything else, Mossy? That's it. All right, we're going to take a real quick break. When we come back, there's all sorts of transfer news going on around the world, and we're going to take a look at that. So don't go anywhere. All right, we're back, Mossy. Uh, transfer news. Let's let's d- dig right into it because there's players moving, going all over the place, and some interesting moves. Where do you want to start? Well, I didn't plan it this way, but there's a lot of news involving Brazilian players. Um, I hate uh, Neymar transfer rumors as much as everybody else does, but uh, this weekend, uh, this story gained some steam and and has legs and has now become a thing, so we, we, we should acknowledge it here. Um, so PSG are desperate to unload Neymar. Keep in mind, last summer, they gave him a monster uh, contract extension. I said on this podcast at the time that was a terrible move. Uh, and I'm a Neymar fan. I spent an inordinate amount of time on this podcast defending him. But even if you don't agree with any of the criticisms of him as a player, the mere fact that he's entering his 30s and has had this horrible injury record the last few years made it not a prudent investment to give him the contract they did. Uh, a year later, they've completely regretted and <laughs> uh, realized they made a mistake. Uh, Neymar uh, this past season had his least productive campaign for PSG, and there were some signs that he might be entering the state of physical decline. The injuries have taken their toll. He didn't have quite the same acceleration as before. Um, And they've brought in Luis Campos as sporting director, Christophe Galtier as as the manager, although I don't think that one's official yet. Um, And they want to build a more balanced team, a 4-4-2 with Messi and Mbappe up there and a stronger midfield. So to me, it all makes perfect sense from the PSG perspective. But now that they gave him this massive contract, he's become a very difficult player to move because not that many clubs are willing to absorb that contract for Neymar at this point in his career. The only two rumors that I've heard that feel remotely credible are Juventus might be thinking about it. And then he's somewhere on Chelsea's transfer list, although I think they'd rather sign Raheem Sterling and Usman Dembele. Only if they strike out with those two might they uh, go for Neymar, that American owner Todd Bully wants to make a splash. Um, I don't know how a few months out from the world cup, Neymar's club situation being unsettled, uh, overall take Juventus, Chelsea. I don't think he's going, (laughs) I don't think he's going anywhere, but the Juventus thing is interesting because obviously the Pogba thing has happened. They're talking about Di Maria going there. So Juventus is, you know, gearing up for some, some really big things. And we think about it in terms of, you know, how, where does that leave Weston McKinney, by the way, thinking about it in terms of American players, you know, for example, when you talk about, um, Calvin Phillips going from Leeds uh, and opening up spots and, play, and players leaving Leeds, especially with all the talk around Tyler Adams potentially coming to join uh, Jesse Marsh uh, from uh, you know from Germany. That could be that could be interesting. When you talk about U.S. players, the Raheem Sterling to Chelsea uh, move that might be interesting in terms of how it impacts Christian Pulisic, especially with players out there out wide uh, that are playing wide, and especially with the way that Tuchel. I mean. I guess it has to be said, looks at Christian Pulisic or doesn't look at Christian Pulisic as his as his cup of tea. And then, you know, one other one, and this is kind of we've talked about this over the years, is Zach Steffen and the rumors of him possibly looking for a loan. And that 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 in and of itself is nothing new. But what has happened with Zach Steffen is he has become valuable to Man City as their second goalkeeper, notwithstanding the mistake he made in in the cup and that that happens. But I think that if you're Pep right now and you're looking at Zach Steffen, you're saying, well, why am I loaning out a player who makes me more comfortable and makes us more secure as our second goalkeeper if something were to happen? Pep Guardiola 
has no responsibility to the U.S. men's national team, nor does he have a responsibility to Zach Steffen to prepare him for the U.S. men's national team, which is why something like this would happen. He would go, he would theoretically be the starter, and then he would be playing and then be that much more attractive to Greg Berhalter as a starter come November and December. But he, he is a to a certain extent, a victim of his own talent and success. And even though he hasn't played a lot, from a pure Manchester City perspective, Zach Steffen is more valuable as a number two than he is being loaned out someplace to play, which only really benefits him in his national team pursuits. Uh, other stuff well, you want to hit on there, Mossy, or, 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 or going back to stuff that I briefly hit on? No, just to note, Arsenal have been uh, the most active of the – Premier League Big Six, and one of the moves they officially announced is Matt Turner. So Matt Turner goes to Arsenal, and I haven't read anything about him being loaned out. If Stefan does get a loan, then that situation will kind of turn on its head because then for the next few months, Stefan will be the guy playing more regularly at club level. Uh, keep in mind, Ethan Horvath also trying to secure a move away from Nottingham Forest and to go somewhere where he can play regularly. So yeah, the U.S. goalkeeper situation is going to be interesting to watch here the rest of this transfer window when the dust settles and then what it means for the few months leading up to the World Cup. And I think we mentioned this a, a couple of weeks ago on the pod. You know, Greg Berhalter in the last window was very... In, in a really interesting way, very clear about how he was going to play the players who were playing. And again, I get it. He has to say that. But I think all of this uh, potential movement and or drama regarding our goalkeepers is going to be moved. I don't think it's going to ultimately matter if the player is playing or if the player isn't. I think Greg Berhalter in his mind has who he wants to play. And I think it's, I think it's Zach Steffen ultimately, because if, but if it truly is about who is playing, as we've said before, chances are, unless some loans happen here, that it's going to be Sean Johnson <laughs> who is playing. Oh, by the way, it was sensational. This past he was sensational that. yesterday and I would have no problem with him playing, but if you are really going to stand on principle and what you say, and I'm going to you know, hold you to your word, then there's a really good chance that it's going to be Sean Johnson, who's the one who is playing, who is playing consistently, and who is playing well relative to uh, Zach Steffen, Matt Turner, and even Ethan Hor Horvath for that matter. Uh, uh, what I else? I mentioned Arsenal have been super active. They make the Matt Turner signing official. They're bringing William Saliba back from Marseille. They sign Fabio Vieira, this uh, young Portuguese playmaker from Porto. And they've completed the signing of Gabriel Jesus from Manchester City for sounds like around 50 million pounds. Um, interesting one. I was talking to Arsenal super fan Moe Du about it uh, this past weekend. He's a bit torn on this one. Uh, Gabriel Jesus uh, is a guy who flashed some superstar potential early in his career and then just settled into being a good player. And I think there's enough empirical evidence that in that Manchester City ecosystem, all he was ever going to be is a good player. And so him going from City to Arsenal, he's only 25, is him taking a little bit of a step back in the hopes that in a different situation, he might still be able to blossom into that superstar that at one point we all thought he would be. But undergirding all this is this question about what his best position is, I find him to be a bit of a tweener between center forward and winger. He's pretty good at both, not great at either. It seems like this move to Arsenal is with the intention of being a week-in, week-out center forward, which makes a lot of sense from a Brazil perspective because Brazil absolutely loaded with wide attacking players right now, uh, but unsettled at center forward. So Gabriel Jesus' best path towards starting at this World Cup would be if he goes to Arsenal, plays week-in and week-out as a center forward, plays well, scores lots of goals, he could emerge as that starter there. Well, if he played on the wing, no matter how well he played, when you've got Rafinha and Anthony and Vinicius Jr. and Rodrigo and guys like that, uh, I don't think he's ever going to send to a starting position there. So it's interesting. My hot take involving Brazilians at Arsenal is that I actually think Gabriel Martinelli has better center forward instincts than Gabriel Jesus. It's disappointing to me that Arteta doesn't view Martinelli as more of a center forward option. So it's going to be weird watching them next season playing together, Martinelli on the wing, Jesus down the middle, and kind of imagining, well, what if they switch <laughs> places? But sounds like that's not how it's going to be. Um, Arsenal staying with the Brazilian theme, uh, it sounds like have emerged as the front runners to sign Rafinha um, from Leeds United, which... To be honest, I'm not that keen on because he plays the same position as Arsenal's best player, uh, Saka. 
And, and so it sounds like they're viewing Rafinha as a depth piece. And ironically enough, there, there are better clubs than Arsenal that are interested in Rafinha, where I think he would have a more realistic path towards being a week-in, week-out starter, including Barcelona, which is his dream move. He's trying to hold out as long as he can to give Barcelona a chance to raise the funds to go buy him. But if it takes too much longer, then he's going to accept the move to Arsenal. Um, and so... And, you know, we'll see how that all plays out. But yeah, and Rafinha obviously leaving impacts Jesse Marsh. Uh, they're bringing in Brendan Aronson as something of a replacement there. You mentioned Calvin Phillips going to Man City. Tyler Adams potentially being a replacement there. So yeah, it's uh, it's been interesting to follow all this from a Leeds perspective, Jesse Marsh, and uh, and then also you know where some of these players leaving Leeds could end up. So yeah, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on. And there is interesting stuff going on. Although I was talking to Stu Holden last night, and he was mentioning because you know with his uh, yeah, ownership uh, of uh, Mallorca over there, the the ebbs and flows of when the markets are hot and when they're not. And obviously, for for most, this is the summertime. And you know, these are all humans that are involved. And they've, they've gone through a big year. And the, you know, the, the relationship between people going on break and taking vacations relative to when these deals ultimately get done. And so we're in one of those down and dip times, but it'll very, very quickly ramp up. And you may see a, um, not just a smattering, like a, you know, a, a full on massive type of movement with multiple, multiple deals uh, going down. And a lot of times it's relative to just who's around. Uh, and it's not that you can't be in contact, but there are, there are more fertile and productive times than others, shall we say, relative to just, you know, human behavior out there. One last, um, last thing, then we'll move on. Um, yeah. On City, uh, you know, when they sign Erlen Holland, we all imagine, wow, you're taking this City team and plopping Erlen Holland on top of it. They're going to be unbeatable next season. And they're actually losing some pieces here. If, if Jesus is gone, if Sterling goes to Chelsea, there's even been rumors about Bernardo Silva to Barcelona. I don't know how they would possibly afford that. Um I still think on balance, they come out ahead because Holland is a generational talent uh, and is going to score so many goals there. And, and Julian Alvarez is very good as well. But they, they are losing some players, some production from, from the, the wing positions with, with Sterling and Jesus. And then if they lose Bernardo Silva, that's one of their best midfielders. So it'll be interesting to see how that Manchester City team looks when the dust settles here. And they're also losing Fernandinho's leadership. I think Calvin Phillips is a very good young player, but... You know, I don't know if he right away steps in and then gives him what Fernandinho gave him. So uh, it'd be interesting to see kind of what Manchester City looks like next season. I mean, we've hit a lot of uh, EPL stuff. Anything uh, from other leagues that you want to hit on before we head? I know you got a, a take on uh, Copa Lib. Yeah, I know uh, Luis threw in a couple things here, but uh, I don't know. Mario Gutzel, does he still move the needle for you? <laughs> he, he joins hey. Eintracht Frankfurt, who just won the Europa League. I mean, uh, and Kunku extending his contract, I think that, I mean, this is a, a definite talent. And so that he yeah. continues on as opposed to going someplace else. That's interesting, I think. And Gutzel had been linked with uh, move to MLS potentially. So, uh, but he chooses to stay in Europe. Um, yeah, but we'll end on Copa Lib. Uh, the uh, knockout stage gets underway this week. Uh, the big overarching theme of Copa Lib the last couple of years has been the dominance of Brazilian clubs. The last two finals have been all Brazilian. And the reason for that dominance has been the, the financial advantage, the ability of Brazilian clubs to add big name players uh, over the course of this competition. And that whole narrative might be turned on its head here because it sounds like River Plate, from all reports, are about to sign Luis Suarez, which would be an earth shattering move. And in my view, would make them the prohibitive favorite to win Copa Libertadores this year above any of the Brazilian clubs. Bear in mind, the Brazilian clubs are making some good moves as well. Fernandinho, who we just talked about, uh, he's joining Atlético Paranaense, who, and that's a that's a club to keep an eye on in this competition. They made a coaching change. They brought in Scolari, uh, and since he took over, they've been lights out. Uh, they have a very good squad, and now they're adding the leadership of Fernandinho. And so uh, they play Libertad of Paraguay in the round of 16. Um, and then if they get past them, uh, Fernandinho would be eligible for the quarterfinals. Um, so keep an eye on that. 
Um, you have Palmeiras, your two-time defending uh, champions who uh, play Cerro Porteño uh, in the round of 16. They're, they're Palmeiras looking very strong as well. Wouldn't surprise me if they won it again. Um, Atlético Mineiro, who if they beat Emelec in the round of 16 are on sort of a collision course to face Palmeiras in the quarterfinals. Um, Flamengo have had a, a mess of a, of a season so far. They just changed coaches. They got rid of Paulo Sosa, brought in Dorival Jr., but still a very talented squad. And they've added Everton Cebolinha, from uh, Benfica, who again would be eligible in the quarterfinals. Uh, they faced Deportivo Tolima in the round of 16. So a lot of good Brazilian clubs that are making moves and have talented rosters and 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 all that. But I'm sorry, uh, River Plate, who it was already some, something of a surprise that Marcelo Gallardo stuck around for another year. People thought he was going to leave. And this is probably his last year there. There's kind of a last dance feel. People think he stayed to try to win the Copa Lib again. They're losing Julian Alvarez, who I just mentioned, who's joining Manchester City in the summer. But Luis Suarez would be just an incredible replacement. So River Plate, which is already one of the two or three contenders to win it anyway. And you add a striker like Suarez. Hold on a second. Hold on a second. You just, you just ridiculed Mario Gutza over there here. So, (laughs) and you know, it's not like Luis Suarez is the Luis Suarez of five, 10 years ago. And it's not as if he's playing every single game, but you really think that he's that much of a relevant player in terms of moving the needle? Absolutely. Okay. Uh, that would be scary oh. uh, from from a Brazilian perspective. I'm hoping this deal doesn't that something blows up in the next couple of days, but all the reports <laughs> are that they're going to get him. The, the, if you look at the Copa Lib bracket, though, it's a little bit strange. Um, there, there are six Brazilian clubs and six Argentinian clubs in around 16. So 12 of the 16 are from that con- those two countries, which, by the way, is a whole other conversation. And, and there's a lot of concern that those two countries are dominating to a, an unhealthy degree. But um, four of the Argentinian clubs are all in one little corner of the bracket. Uh, River played after play Vélez Sarsfield in the round of 16 and then Colón played Talleres. And then the winners of those matchups uh, play in the quarterfinals. So You've got four Argentine. I guess the glass half full is it guarantees there's going to be one in the semis, which yeah. there wasn't last year. But the downside is they're going to knock out each other. And so four is going to go down to one. Uh, when I think if those teams had been in other parts of the bracket, they all were good enough to maybe go far. So yeah, they're going to um, they're going to thin the Argentinian herd right there. Okay. And, and I, I think it's interesting from River Plate's perspective. I always think it's scary facing teams from your the same country in these continental competitions. There's lots of examples with UCL over the years from the Arsenal Invincibles in 2004 losing to Chelsea in the quarterfinals, City in 2018 losing to Liverpool in the quarterfinals, Barcelona losing to Atletico Madrid twice in the quarters in 14 and 16. It's not the same intimidation factor. They're used yeah. to playing against you. So River Plate is going to have to deal with that in the round of 16 against Velas. And then if they get through that with against either Colón or Tajet is in the quarterfinals. So, uh, if they survive all that and they get to the semis and Luis Suarez is playing uh, for them by that point, then I think that they're going to go on and win it. Um, but yeah, i uh, very excited. Copa Lib knockout stage is upon us uh, starts this week. So uh, I'll be watching for sure. Awesome. Awesome. All right. We're going to take a quick break. When we come back, it's time for ask Alexi. Don't go anywhere. All right. We're back and it's time for uh, ask Alexi. You know, you send us in those questions on the social media platforms out there using that hashtag ask Alexi, or you call us at our uh, state of the union podcast hotline number 657-549-2297. That's 657-549-2297. I think we got some Twitter questions this week, Mossy. What are they? Um, first up, at BA316, um, what are your thoughts on the U.S. Women's National Team versus Columbia? Um, okay. So, obviously, <laughs> they won 3 nothing, and, and, you know, as is often the case when the U.S. plays against pretty much of the world, there is, it's difficult, as we've said before, to take much out of it. The U.S. was much better than Colombia. They missed two penalties, by the way. Um, Colombia put up a valiant effort, but that's the most that you can expect from the majority of teams out there, as opposed to, you know, the, the four, let's say, teams that actually can give the U.S. a game. But, you know, we're also spinning this ahead and we are in a time where Vlako Andonovsky is, you know, testing new things. That old guard is starting to move out, whether they want to or not. And Vlako is, is doing some interesting things. And so, you know, we see Sophia Smith, who, uh, who had her two goals. We see, you know, even uh, you know, uh, Taylor Korniak, uh, who came in in her first appearance. And, you know, she's six foot one uh, and brings a completely different dimension. And so talk about the rich uh, getting richer. Now, keep in mind that uh, Macario is injured and out. And I think she was 
going to be that number nine leading the line. And so now you have, uh, you know, Alex Morgan back in the fold and back on the field and doing some uh, doing some good things. Uh, so I don't think that we can, as usual, read too much into this particular game other than the fact that not only is the U.S. good, but it continues to generate depth and talent that at this point, maybe more so than any time that we've seen in the last 10 years, let's say, continues to challenge and make themselves heard to take the mantle away. Now, this 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 camp had the likes of, uh, as I said, mentioned Alex Morgan and Megan Rapino and Becky Sabrin back in camp, and they are going to have a say ultimately. And I think, you know, while we saw this week the 26 man roster be announced, I think the women are also going to have that going forward in the World Cup next year, which will enable Vaco to have more players, more players there. But I think right now. Qualifying hasn't been, nor should it ever be a, qual- a problem, even though that's what this was kind of preparing us for. The U.S. is going to qualify, and the U.S. is going to take a stellar group, albeit a changed group, but I think a refreshed and hungry group to the World Cup next year in Australia and, uh, and New-, New Zealand. So all in all, it was good. It could have been much worse in terms of the scoreline. I guess worse for Colombia, better for the U.S. Um, that they missed two penalties isn't isn't great. But the Colombian goalkeeper actually played even even more than just saving the penalties. Actually played very very well. And if you're playing the U.S., you are going to need that type of performance, especially from a goalkeeper, because you know it's going to be an onslaught. The interesting thing about this game also is that for the U.S., more often than not, it's about breaking down a team that is bunkered in a low block, whatever you want to call it. And at times that is about patience and it's not while the tendency is to expect them to score multiple goals and lots of goals. And oftentimes they do that. Sometimes a, an inferior team we know can park the bus. We know can make it very, very difficult. And it's just about being patient. And even in this game where the goals weren't coming, they were patient and eventually they came as they will, because for most teams out there that do establish this type of posture, it it's it's not sustainable over 90 minutes and eventually they will crack and there's enough talent on the u.s team individually and collectively collectively to find the the problems and to find the vulnerabilities and i think that that's going to be a reoccurring type of case and assessment of this team as they go forward until they reach usually it's you know the quarterfinal semifinals where they actually come up against somebody that is formidable and somebody that gives them a game uh, programming note, we actually have the Copa America Femenina. We'll be covering that next month. That is hosted by Colombia. So uh, these friendlies are playing against the U.S. or Colombia preparing for, for that, while the U.S. also is preparing for the CONCACAF Championship, which serves as World Cup qualifying for the region. So um, so we have that to look forward to next month. So we'll start to find out some of the teams in the you know, Women's World Cup. Um, next up, uh, at DMALS74, um, how is Mexico higher than the U.S. in the FIFA rankings? They aren't even champions of their confederation, lost to U.S. twice last year and tied them on their home soil. Makes no sense. Maybe Alexi has answers. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a big maybe. Uh, maybe Mossy has answers when it comes to – look, the, we know that when it comes to the rankings – when they are beneficial and they make us look good, then obviously they're very, very important and incredibly credible. Uh, When they don't, then it's a joke and it's ridiculous. Now, the whole coefficient and the formula that is part of how they come to these these rankings um, is complex, (laughs) I guess confusing, but ultimately it spews out these, these positions and these numbers based on who you're playing, when you are playing, how many times you are playing, and it can make things look drastically different than what the smell test is or what the eye test is. I guess it. I guess it would be. You know, that's a long way of saying that. I mean, I'm sure maybe Mossy can explain the actual numbers as to how this comes to be, but put as much or as little stock into the rankings as you possibly want. I mean, you look where Canada is and how good Canada has been. I think right now, when you look at a team like, um, like Belgium, 
I mean, I think that they, in what we have just recently seen, are much higher than they should be, as opposed to Denmark, who I know Mossy's talked about a whole lot, that probably should be higher than the, uh, you know, the tenth position or wherever, uh, wherever they are. So, look, as I said, take it for whatever value you feel, and we can poo-poo it, and we can say this is ridiculous, and oftentimes it is ridiculous. But it's based on data and numbers, ultimately. And while they say numbers don't lie, when it comes to this, they can. I mean, the first thing to understand is that this is not like a college football AP poll where people vote on it and they apply this logic of, well, this team beat that team, so they have to be ranked above them. It's more akin to the tennis rankings. It's a point system. They have an algorithm um, in which uh, competitive matches uh, count more than friendlies, knockout stage matches count more than group games. Some competitions count more than others. Uh, the FIFA ranking of your opponents is taken into account. Um, and, and it, it's important to understand, uh, Mexico entered the summer of 21, like 10 spots ahead of the U S which did make some sense. If you think about it, Mexico reached the knockout stage of the last world cup. The U S didn't even qualify. Mexico then won the gold cup in 2019. They had better results in the first part of the cycle. Then COVID hit 2020. There wasn't much going on. International football resumed in 21 and going into those nations league semis. Like I said, Mexico was way ahead of the U S the U S beat Mexico in that final. They then beat him again in the gold cup. And that, uh, closed the gap. And then when the U.S. beat Mexico in the octagonal in November of 21, they overtook them. So in the last two rankings of 2021, the U.S. was ahead of Mexico. They ended 2021 three spots ahead of Mexico. And then Mexico finished the octagonal stronger than the U.S. It didn't seem that way because they were still playing like crap. But in, just in terms of results, they collected seven out of nine points in each of the last two windows. Well, and the U.S. lost a couple of games. They lost away the to Canada. They lost the way to Costa Rica in their very last game. Um, but still, the swing was surprising. The first ranking of 2022 in February, Mexico was back ahead of the U.S. And then in the March 22 rankings, which were ultimately used for the World Cup draw, Mexico was six spots ahead of the U.S. So that was quite the swing from December of 21, where the U.S. was three spots ahead, to March of 22, where Mexico was six spot, spots ahead, a nine-spot swing. I, I'd have to get a mathematician here to explain that to me because I don't totally get that. And bear in mind, Mexico, they shot up all the way up to number nine. They almost were a pot one team in this World Cup. All it would have taken was Portugal to lose to North Macedonia in that playoff, and Mexico would have been a pot one team, which is ridiculous because right now I don't think Mexico are one of the 20 best national teams in the world. Um, so uh, that was a long journey uh, to tell you, D-Malls, that I kind of agree with you. I, I don't totally understand. Uh, once the U.S. got out ahead, I don't totally understand how it flipped again. But hey, uh, to Alexi's point, it's some sort of mathematical formula, and that's what it spit out. Keep in mind, by the way, they made a big point. They instituted a new system in 2018, and they made a big point of saying that they weren't going to weigh the regions that differently because they didn't want it to be too biased towards Europe and South America. They wanted to give teams and other confederations a chance to rise up the rankings. And Mexico and the U.S. are the only non-European, non-South American teams in the top two pots for the World Cup. Um, so it, it's interesting that those are the only two that got in there. Senegal, the African champions, are pot three. You know, might they be looking at that and being, why, why aren't we ahead of either Mexico or the U.S.? Um, I don't know. So there's all sorts of different ways you can look at it. You can look at who's in front of you, who's behind you, and and some countries feel hard done and others don't. I don't know. It's uh... <laughs> it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. I mean, and and you ask, well, does it matter? Yeah, it, it matters in terms of sometimes it can be the difference between wh where you are in tournaments uh, and, you know, seating and all that kind of stuff. So it, in this it, case, it, it doesn't matter. because both the U.S. and Mexico ended up in pot two. So, yes. but just from a rivalry standpoint, I know U.S. fans would like to be above them. Um, yeah, we're, yeah, we're, we're, we're better than them. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> Regardless um, of what FIFA may say. All right. What's next? Well, you, uh, Luis stuck this in here. You, you already alluded to the 26 players thing, mm -hmm. but just to, uh, so yeah, FIFA did make it official uh, rosters will be 26. And, and by the way, that's been more or less decided for a while. The big sticking point was how many of those players could be on the bench for a game. And they've decided all of them. So uh, you can have 15 subs essentially for each world cup game and you're allowed up to five substitutions. So uh, you know, managers were concerned that, yeah, you know, you let me bring 26, but if I have to cut three of them for each game and still only have 23 on the bench for morale, that's a tough conversation to have with a player. So they're all thrilled that FIFA agreed to let everybody who's in the, on the squad to, in theory, be an available sub for each game. Yeah. 
so you know we were over like i said at uh, at fifa at the uh, at the headquarters and you know, there was talk about this and it came out actually right when i got back so you're welcome i i orchestrated that and said listen <laughs> you guys need to get your shit together and you need to figure this out and announce this now um to your point it, I, i'm glad that they decided that everybody can be involved i mean you're bringing everybody let's and and keep in mind, we're still in the age of COVID and all sorts of craziness can happen. Um, you know, there was a, a practical <laughs> consideration of, you know, bench space and all, all of that kind of stuff, which obviously they sorted, uh, they sorted through. And so everybody is going to be available. Like I mentioned, I think that this is going to be a norm in the same way that we saw the five substitutes kind of become law and the norm. I think that this is going to continue on and it. You know, it makes sense, especially in this modern age where I think, thankfully, we think so much more about about the players individually and about these teams and giving them every opportunity to be good. And I guess in that sense, thinking about the fans and we've talked before about wanting to see these players and being given opportunities and how it sucks if because of limited amount of substitutions or a limited amount of avail availability, you can't see them. And I always, I always thought it was weird, you know, the the alternate role, and we've seen it in Olympics, we've seen it in World Cups and and tournaments, uh, in sports, in a lot of different sports, and it's such a strange role to have to play. And so that all twenty six of these players will be available. I don't think that this changes the the psychology or the strategy when it comes to goalkeepers. So I still think three are going to be used on goalkeepers. I don't think anybody is using those extra players to bring yet another goalkeeper. I just don't think it makes sense. So, you know, it's going to be field players. And for that matter, it's probably going to be, you know, Masa, you know this as well, you know, because Brazil is famous for using that last spot, if you will, to blood a young player that then goes on to big things. I think there will be an element of that. From a U.S. perspective, it makes it interesting because, you know, this is arguably the most amount of talent and depth that we have. I still think that there is going to be some players that don't make the roster that people are going to argue about and debate about. It's going to be less so now with uh, three more players. And so if you're, you know, if you're Jordan Morris or you're uh, uh, Roldan or something like that, I think that they would have been on the 23 anyway. But there are certainly those that argue that, that won't. This gives you a little bit more of a cushion. Uh, going uh, going forward, and I think it's a, I think it's a good thing. And you know, I'm I'm excited for the coaches that are able to look down that bench and have a much bigger palette to choose from to affect change in that game. And from an American perspective, and therefore a selfish perspective, it's going to potentially give the experience of a lifetime to yet another three players that otherwise wouldn't be able uh, to have that. And I guarantee that at some point in the World Cup, uh, there are going to be substitutions made from players that we will find out later on, had it been 23, that that coach would not have taken that player as part of the 23. And they are going to you know, either make an impact off the bench or even start, but they are going to have a moment in the World Cup that is going to, in a certain sense, be gifted to them because of this decision. And I'm glad, I'm glad that they are going to have that opportunity. And I'm glad from our perspective watching that we will be given that opportunity to be able to, uh, to see them. Um, anything else, Mossy here? Uh, so last question um, at C Gary one Oh two, two asks, um, hi, Alexi thoughts on the USA uh, under 20 chances. Um, I think that they're going to qualify. And when I say qualify, uh, for people that don't know, in CONCACAF right now with the qualifying that is going on right now, not only is our U.S. under-20 team qualifying for the under-20 World Cup, um, which is next year in India, right, Masi? Correct. But they are also using this tournament as an opportunity to qualify for the next Olympics. And for those that have followed us, especially over the last few cycles, uh, will know that this is something that we haven't been to uh, in a decade. Uh, in terms of the Olympics, uh, we are well on our way. Uh, Masa, you've been watching these games, and I think you would uh, be the first to say that the U.S. is, you know, the cream of the crop. And barring something catastrophic happening, this is a team that is not only going to win their quarterfinal game, uh, which is which is upcoming against Costa Rica. We're recording this on Monday. It's going to happen on Tuesday, and that quarterfinal game will enable them to qualify for 
the World Cup, the Under-20 World Cup. But they are also, after they win that game, are going to go to the semifinals. And that game, if they were to win it, and I think they will win it, will qualify them automatically to the Olympics. So I think that this is going to be a resounding success for this under 20 team when it comes to getting to the world cup and getting us back to the Olympics, something that we have uh, squandered and wasted for multiple cycles. Now. I agree. It's a very talented team. Diego Luna is a really interesting player. Um, and this was a great thing for the U S uh, CONCACAF making this change because we know the troubles the U S has had at the under 23 level, but uh, no such problems at the under 20 level. So this also serving as Olympic qualifying, I think really benefits the U S uh, the big news here from our perspective is that Fox sports acquire the rights to the knockout stage of this tournament. All the round of 16 matches uh, were on FS2, including the U S is five, no win over Nicaragua. The quarterfinal matches will all be on FS2 as well, including, as you mentioned, uh, we're taping this on a Monday. Tomorrow, the U.S. faces Costa Rica in the quarterfinals. If they win, they clinch a berth in the 2023 Under-20 World Cup in India. And then both semis and the final will be on FS1. I'm excited to work those. Uh, keep in mind, I, while I think the U.S. is going to qualify, um, uh, right now they're on a collision course to face host Honduras in these semifinals. And Honduras has been the country that's given the U.S. a lot of trouble <laughs> at the under-23 level. Uh, they've won all four games in this tournament, outscoring the opposition 13-1. to one. Uh, They face Panama in the quarterfinals. I expect them to win that. So that would mean U.S. and USA, I expect to beat Costa Rica. That would mean USA, Honduras, Friday night for a berth in the Olympics on FS1. That's a must-watch. Mexico is on the other side of the bracket. They've outscored the opposition in their four games 19 to zero. There's a nil nil in there. So they've done all their damage in the other three games, but uh, you know, they don't impact the U S as far as qualifying for any of this stuff because they're on the other side of the bracket. So the U S and Mexico, the earliest they could meet would be in the final. Um, and at that point, the U S would have already clinched uh, Olympic birth and all that, but still it would be a USA Mexico final of a tournament with a trophy on the line. And, and that would have some juice to it. So uh, yeah, exciting stuff coming up uh, with this tournament on, on, on Fox sports. You mentioned a, a couple of players, including uh, Luna who plays for uh, RSL. I mean, this is this next generation that we talk so much about. And these seeds have been planted a long time. Quinn Sullivan from the Philadelphia union, getting a lot of play. You know, we've seen the K Cowles um, and the Paxton Aronsons and the Caden Clarks uh, out there uh, that have been doing it. I mean, this is, this is a talented group. Uh, almost every single player is from major league soccer. Um, a couple of different players. Uh, let's see Mauricio Cuevas playing for Bruges. Uh, let's see, Alejandro uh, Alvarado, uh, Vizela, but, and Hydric Split there uh, for Rocas Puxtas. So, and these are all 17, 18, 19 year old players. Some of them, like we said, we have seen because uh, they're already playing uh, or even starting at that for that matter at times for their MLS team. Some of them are just kind of jumping on the scene and we'll use this as a platform. And you know, uh, so I wish them luck <laughs> going going forward for both of these things. It would be great if uh, when all is said and done, and like as Masi said, you can watch it when all is said and done. We have not only qualified for the under-20 World Cup, but we have returned to the Olympics once again because it has been such a wasted platform and opportunity for so many years. And there is now multiple generations that have not been given that opportunity. And I can tell you, even way back in my day, back in the 1900s, a huge group of players matriculated from that Olympic team to the national team and featured in the 1994 World Cup. And uh, so let's here's to uh, to that happening again. Anything else, Mossy? The last time the U.S. played in the Olympics was 2008. So long ago. Think about this. Stu Holden and Moe Du were on that team. Oh, my goodness. Just young pups. <laughs> Just young pups. I wonder if Mo cried after that elimination. Oh, let's get, we showed Mo crying after the exit from the uh, the World Cup, and he was he was not happy. Mo's a, Mo's a lover, not a fighter. He's 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 a beautiful man. You know, he's a beautiful man, whether he's crying or not. So, I mean, I loved I loved the emotion, as as painful as it was, I'm sure, in the moment for him. And by the way, many years later, to watch it on television last night on our broadcast, it was beautiful pictures, beautiful pictures of a beautiful man. Uh, anything else, Mossy? That's it. All right. We're going to take a real quick break and uh, wrap up the show here with one for the road. Don't go anywhere. All right. We're back. And it's the end of our show. Thank you for hanging with us uh, throughout it all. And at the end of each and every show, as you know, I give you my one for the road. Mossy, we, we find ourselves in a, in a really interesting summer and a unique summer. Um, I, I, I've come across so many people either 
you know, on the uh, on the road here in my recent travels or you know online that feel like there is this void right now because in normal times we would already be knee deep in a World Cup experience, and there's almost this <laughs> this this sense of loss where people are getting up and they don't have that during the summer. And for those of us that work it like you and myself and others right now, I, I, I totally, I totally get that. Now, the other side is that we are going to be given this incredibly unique and different experience come November and December, but it does give us, like I said, a, uh, an expanse, a, a time frame here that in normal times, we don't have. And let's be honest, whether it's a World Cup or a Copa America or a Gold Cup or a Women's World Cup, we are working these things. So usually our summers at some point are filled with some sort of tournament. And I love a soccer tournament. I love the drama. I love the excitement, the competition. I love the the way it comes to define nations who are hosting, the way we are exposed to nations and colors out there when it comes to a World Cup. So yeah, I'm I'm jonesing a little bit for a World Cup. It's probably just going to make me that much more excited about November and December. But it also provides opportunity, as I said at the beginning of the show, for me to do some different things and to do a little bit of traveling, especially over the last couple of years. I'm actually on my travels out to the East Coast, I'm going to see my mother. Um, my mother listens to this show. Uh, my mother <laughs> watches the different things that I that I do. She agrees with some of them, doesn't agree with other ones, but you know, I'm still her son. I have not seen my mother in a number of years uh, because of the, the COVID situation and because of just the way life has worked. So I can't wait uh, to see her. She is, like many people that are out there, um, a, a soccer mom. In, in the best of senses. And she has, uh, you think I've seen it all. Well, she has seen it all in a really, really unique way, being the mother of, uh, of a soccer player through the 70s and 80s and 90s and continued on and everything uh, that we had. Uh, my point is that I am going to try to use this time to get out there and to do some different things that normally wouldn't, wouldn't happen at this moment. and. Um, I'm really excited about it and I can't wait. I can't wait to get out there on the road uh, with my family and yes, you know, get a little bit of a, uh, of a break. I hope everybody can enjoy uh, a part of this summer, even without a tournament uh, there. I hope everybody can enjoy, if you're in the United States, the holiday that we have coming up celebrating what I feel is the greatest nation in the world in the United States and July 4th and what that means to us um, and all of the good, bad and everything in between that is our country, but I believe ultimately it's the celebration of all of the good. And there is so much good and so much more good than bad, uh, than bad out there. We will do a, uh, a pod next week on, uh, we'll record it on Monday and it'll be out on Tuesday. And so we'll be, uh, you know, around that July 4th, uh, July 4th time. But I hope that uh, whether you listen to that or not, I hope that you are having a good summer. I hope that you are around family and friends, I hope that you are celebrating. I hope that you are close. Um, and I hope that you're happy uh, because there are so many things to be thankful for, uh, whether it's whether you live in the United States uh, or not. Um, Mossy, anything uh, before we go? Uh, one last thing. What do you got um, for me? I can see you. I can see the wheels spinning over there. Uh, late last week, uh, myself, you, and Stu Holden were involved in a big meeting with the bosses at Fox Sports Digital. Felt like a mafia sit down. They were all sitting on one side of the table. We were sitting in the other. It was to go over plans for the next few months leading up to the World Cup. I don't want to reveal too much here, but lots of exciting stuff that you're going to be involved with, that Stu's going to be involved with, and uh, involving this podcast. There have even been some preliminary discussions about it being more than once a week, which uh, I know a lot of our fans have been calling for. Um, thoughts on that? Yeah, I mean, you know, so, uh, to your point, I mean, I had talked to uh, Luis about it before. Um, you know, we, it, it, like any business, if you're not growing, you're dying. And we want to grow. And I think we... And if you listen back to what we were when we first came on, are we now what, four and a half years or something like that? Yeah. Uh, if you look back to what we were, 
you know, we've changed, we've changed format, we've changed tone. And I think for the better, and we've been reactive, you know, not trying to be everything to everybody, but we've been reactive. And when things have worked, we've continued with it. When things haven't worked, we've, we've kind of gone, uh, gone away from it, but we also want to grow. And we also want to, I guess, serve, if you will, the, the customer out there. And we want to drive content. And from a digital perspective, Fox is no different than many other content providers out there uh, or broadcasters, if you will. I mean, that's a pretty broad definition nowadays of what a broadcaster is. And so trying to find unique and different ways and more ways to create and drive good content is part and parcel of being in the business. And so something like this, where we do do it once a week, and there's so much that happens. Uh, You know, we know (laughs) from living it that we can go off air and something can break. And what we've actually found is is some of the the reactive type of things that we have done over the years have really resonated out there. And so being um, being relevant and being as up to date as possible is really important. And so we want to try to do some things going forward. I haven't formulated it completely out there, but I would think that as we move forward, uh, whether you want it or not, <laughs> there will be more State of the Union going forward. And we got to be strategic as to how how it and when it comes out there. But, you know, we've kind of built this into something special, I like to think. And we want to try to do it with respect, though. And as opposed to just, you know, more is better, you know, less at times can be more. But whatever we're going to do, we're going to try to make sure that it's quality and that it fits in with everything that we're doing in terms of. Uh, what we have done, but also recognizing that, you know, you probably listen to a lot of different things out there. We're so thankful that people do listen to what we do and we want to try to continue that. And like I said, expand it going forward. So I think you're going to see some of that, especially leading into, you know, a big fall with, uh, with the world cup and all the different things that we're going to be doing there. Uh, I did find it interesting that Luis was not invited to this meeting. And I did raise that issue uh, during the meeting. I asked, why is Luis Aguilar not here and the response from the bosses at Digital was, who's Luis Aguilar? Why do you have to be so mean? No, it's not the response at all. They actually were very complimentary. And it was getting embarrassing, actually, all the good things that they were saying. I had to stop them uh, from, from saying all the good things. So he is a, he is a va- well, we know he's valued over here, but he is also valued by the, uh, the higher ups there. But, you know, this was much more, uh, you know, big picture about everything that's going on. And, you know, the the daily routine that both of us are going to have at the world cup. I mean, even we, we even went into things, uh, you know, like, you know, where social media is going and, you know, for example, like I'm not on TikTok yet and possibly getting on, on TikTok. Although, I mean, I know nobody wants to see me dance or anything like that, but TikTok uh, is probably going to be much more than just uh, dancing. Although maybe people do want to see me dance. I don't know. It could be incredibly, well, funny, let's be honest, and ridiculous for that matter. Uh, Masi, anything before we go? That is it. All right. Thank you so much for listening. I hope everybody has a wonderful week. Uh, if we don't, well, we'll talk to you, but it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to download it. Have a wonderful holiday in terms of July 4th if you are around. And if, if you're not, hope you're having a good summer wherever you are. Like I said, I hope you're spending it with people that, uh, that, are, that you love, uh, whether it's family and friends, and they're making you better and, uh, and the world better ultimately. Uh, keeps uh, rating and uh, uh, reviewing and subscribing and downloading and doing all the different things that you do out there when it comes to the State of the Union podcast. We will see you back here, same time, same place on the State of the Union. And until then, and as always, size the day. You like that clip? Well, my State of the Union podcast drops every week. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts.